I'm going to show you a, another lovely case kindly shared with me by Dr. Antonina Kalmakova, and I'll get, get to that in a moment. Now, my good friend John Han Ho tells me the videos are much better if, if I appear in them. So I, I thought I'd have a, a haircut and a shave and dress up nicely and appear in the bottom right hand corner. You must let me know if if you like this style because I'm a little bit self-conscious and uh, if you think it's great, well, so much the better. But if you think you'd rather I wasn't in the middle of it, well, that would uh, do just as well. I don't mind either way. Now, what this is, this is a case of interstitial granulomatous dermatitis. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit about it before we look at the slide. It's a pretty rare condition, and um, it's not really an entity as such. It's a reaction pattern, and there are so many different causes. Uh, it's particularly associated with autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases, so the collagen vascular groups such as um, lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis and uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, can be an important cause. It may also be a manifestation of an issue with drugs. It can present in patients with uh, lymphoproliferative disorders and so on and so forth. Essentially, um, if you make the diagnosis histologically, then the clinician has got to find out what the underlying condition is. Although generally it's the other way around because the, clin the condition is fairly recognizable to the dermatologist or the clinician. Uh, patients, generally adults, uh, present with papules, often on the arm I think, and they, they sometimes all join up and, and give rise to a a sort of an indurated linear lesion which is sometimes described as cord like and that's probably a jolly good expression so if the patient is known to have lupus and gets this cord like lesion on their arm or neck or something well then the, the, the clinician knows what it is anyway so it's not a big problem but that's not always the case, and so sometimes we get them for histology. Now, uh, granulomatous interstitial dermatitis can show all sorts of different features, and these may depend to some extent on the, on the time of the biopsy. I'm not really sure about that. But in, to my mind's eye and in my personal experience that they often look very like interstitial granuloma or annulari. There are all these cells scattered around separating the collagen fibers, but we're not generally seeing uh, really any great evidence of necrobiosis, although I think it can sometimes be present. Um, the 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 basic process is, is a granulomatous infiltrate composed of uh, for, uh, giant cells, histiocytes, and lymphocytes in aggregate and in the interstitial. Some cases may show a bit of necrobiosis. Some cases have neutrophils in it and sometimes have neutrophils with chiorectic debris. And uh, occasionally you may see eosinophils, and there are, if there are lots of them and the eosinophils degenerate, then you get flame figures. And so this can be one of the causes of the so-called churg strauss granuloma. And uh, I think very exceptionally you may see leukocytoclastic vasculitis, but I, I, I don't think I've experienced that personally. So let's have a look and see what we're, what we're, uh, what we've got. There are multiple bits of tissue, so we'll look at them all or some of them anyway. 
Now, what we're seeing here, there is some scaling on the top but I, and some acanthosis, but I doubt that's of any great importance in the context of this particular case. What we can see is um, there's, a, there's an infiltrate uh, largely limit, limited to the papillary dermis. This is reticular dermis coming down here, and there's not nothing really very much going on. So it's a very superficial infiltrate, which we'll look at at higher power now and see what's what. Now, isn't that just so pretty? It doesn't get nicer. So we've got this infiltrate. It, it's, it's sort of vaguely circumscribed in places. In other parts, it's... Um, it's a little bit more interstitial. Um, if we look at this field, for example, here, we can see, um, isn't now that just just is picture perfect? Uh, Multinucleate giant cells, histiocytes with lots of pinkish cytoplasm and loads of loads of lymph lymphocytes. Let's look at that a bit closer. Um, and that's really, that's such, such a nice field. Now, um, I think the important thing is when you get this type of biopsy, you've got to have a very open mind and have a, try to see the big picture. Um, it may be that the clinician hasn't given you as much information as, he or she should have, and uh, because you can't contact them, you're trying to make the best of a bad job. Uh, just by the by, that might be an eosinophil. It's got reddish cytoplasm. I can't really make out whether it is or isn't, but we can pretend it is for the sake of argument. But what we what we're looking at really is granulomatous inflammation in the dermis with lots of lymphocytes. So if you took this out of contact, out of context, you'd have to think of all of the conditions that can give you this type of appearance. And that would range from, obviously from infections, uh, fungal infections, mycobacterial infections. Uh, you'd have to think of that, maybe leprosy even, uh, foreign body reactions, sarcoidosis of those with so many lymphocytes, that's a bit unlikely, but who knows. And um, the other thing that was that was crossing my mind is syphilis, although we're not seeing lots of, uh, lots of plasma cells. And uh, you, you don't see it very often, but metastatic Crohn's disease can look just like this. So with that field, uh, with no history, you, you're really stuck with doing a whole bunch of special stains. So you're going to have to do a PAS and a Silver and a Zeal Nielsen. And of course that takes hours. The Zeal Nielsen uh, is something you've really got to look at with oil immersion. Otherwise you're wasting your time. And I can tell you a slide like that with oil immersion is going to take you at least an hour. So you have to hope that the clinician has given you sufficient information that you can avoid doing that. Now, there are some features that you can sometimes see which, which I think can be very, uh, very pretty. Sometimes you get phagocytosis of, of connective tissue. And I'm just wondering here, let me see if I can make that slightly, whoops, I've probably done it too far. That might represent a bit of collagen that's been ingested by uh, a histiocyte. I think it probably does, but I, I, I look around. I did notice a very nice field earlier on, and I'm just, I'll have to hunt around and see if I can find it. And while I'm doing it, we'll just, just take, there it is there. You see that there's a lovely field there. No, I'm not sure whether we've reached 40 or not. No, that's better. So there we have a histiocyte, and there's some collagen that's being ingested by that cell. So 
collagenophagocytosis and elastophagocytosis may both be seen in this condition. Now, the 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 authorities like to tell us that um, uh, histiocytes sort of sitting around and, and and enclosing collagen is a a typical feature of this condition. I must say I've never really looked at that, although I did put it in the book because when you write a book, one of the things you have to do is you have to remember that. There are all sorts of experts all around the place who've written amazing papers with bits of information that you didn't know, and so you have to make sure you put it in. And this wrapping of collagen fibers is one of these pieces of information. I suppose with, um, with one's mind's eye, well, I suppose these histocytes are wrapping around collagen. But anyway, I've never really looked for that, but I'm jolly well going to look for it in future. Now that's one piece, so let's see what we can see um, with other bits. There, there's a bit, well, it's not such a good one. I'm gonna go back to the low, to the, uh, to the low power and see what's what, if I can pick up anything better. Now, Oh, I see. So really the problem, this one here looks as if we've got all of the tissue and it's different from the other piece. So let's, let's see if that shows us anything extra. We'll, we'll just turn it around so that it's the right way up. No, we'll do it this way around. That's better. So let's see what's going on in this bit of tissue. Well, it's quite interesting, isn't it? There's all sorts of things going on. There's some spongiosis and uh, ex exocytosis of lymphocytes. Um, and more of a perivascular and follicular infiltrate. Nothing nearly as dramatic as the other one, is it? Let's see if times 20 brings anything more useful up. Well, it's getting a bit granulomatous now, and there's a giant cell, so it's looking a bit like like the other one. Um, is there anything useful that we can get from it? Gosh, I don't think so. I think this is... This, if anything, is just not as interesting as the other bit, and perhaps we shouldn't have bothered looking at this in the first place. Anyway, so um, so that's a nice example of interstitial granulomatous dermatitis. And the take-home message is it's a diagnosis of exclusion. You've got to think of all the other causes of granulomatous inflammation in the dermis before you allow yourself to come to this diagnosis. And the dermatologist is really the person who's going to tell you what it is because they will know or they can find out if they don't know the various uh, systemic diseases or drugs the patient's taking and then you can look it up and check it out and say oh great that's interstitial granulomatous dermatitis so i hope that's been of some use to you and uh, some interest and thank you very much for your attention